Okay, today's daf is Bet Amud Bet. We're two lines from the bottom with Rav Ashi Amar. Uh, the daf is Daf Gimel today. And at the, uh, the, the previous daf was discussing the issue of why do we have this concept of seven days of separation for the Kohen? Only on Yom Kippur and only on the, for the Para Aduma, but we don't find such an institution anywhere else. Okay, and one of the last suggestions that was given on this stuff was, why not one of the other holidays? Sukkot, Pesach, Shemini Atzeret was the last one. So why not Shemini Atzeret? Why don't we tell the Kohen to wait uh, the seven days of Sukkot and then, uh, you know, in order to serve on Shemini Atzeret? So the Gemara had given an answer. Well, there's a difference between, we want it to be exactly like the Miloim, exactly like the dedication of the Mishkan. And over there, there was no Kedusha to the first seven days. It was just a regular seven days followed by the eighth day. Here, you would have the seven days of Sukkot, there Days of Kedusha. You can't compare. So then Ravashi Amar mi ika mi did ika regelo ba'i prishat tafil did ba'i prishat. There's a more fundamental problem here, which is that how could you have a situation where the holiday itself, the main holiday of Sukkot, doesn't require the Kohen to do perisha? He doesn't have to separate for seven days in order to serve on Sukkot. And you're going to tell me that he needs to separate for seven days on, the, on Shemini Atzeret. That doesn't make any sense. Shemini Atzeret is tafel. It's secondary to Sukkot. Even though, according to the opinion that says that Shemini, Shemini Atzeret is regal b'fnei atzmo. It's really its own independent holiday, and therefore one could argue that there, it's not relevant. You can't call it tafel. You can't call it secondary. Still, that's only with regard to pazar kashef, which is, we're going to see an acronym for the things that make Shemini Atzera different. But with regard to fulfilling one's obligation of sacrifices on Sukkot, it's considered still a makeup time for Sukkot itself. Because we learned in the Mishnah, because we learned that somebody who didn't have the opportunity to bring their Korban Chagiga and Olat Riyah, whatever obligations that they had to bring as Korbanot to the Beit HaMikdash on the holiday of Sukkot, they can still continue to bring it. They have an opportunity to bring it through Shemini Atzeret, even though Shemini Atzeret is... Regil bifne atzmo, even though it's considered a separate holiday. Okay, so in other words, there are certain respects um, in which Shemini Atzeret is a different holiday. There are certain ways in which Shemini Atzeret is tafel. It is secondary. It is a makeup for Sukkot. So everybody agrees that in some essential way, especially in terms of korbanot, do you see that? In terms of korbanot, it's secondary to Sukkot because it can still be used as a time to make up for the korbanot that you missed for Sukkot. So obviously, it's not regal bifne atmo in every respect. Now, what are the ways in which Shmini Atzeret is regal bifne atmo? So it said Pazir Kashev. Right? We, have this, um, we have this acronym. Each one of those letters represents something. So the pay of Pazir is Pais. Pais Latmo. What that means is that on Sukkot, they would dis- divide up. Um, the, the Korbanot would normally be divided up on a given uh, day by a lottery. They would assign the different parts to different Kohanim by a lottery. However, on Sukkot, they did not have have a, um, they didn't have a lottery on Sukkot because of the way that it was done, all the korbanot that there were, and all the people that there were. There was no lottery, but on Shemini Atzeret there was a lottery. So they went back to the normal procedure of divvying up the avodah amongst the various kohanim. So therefore, that's what Rashi says, Pais Latz Moshe, and Pais Bifarechag, because there's no, Pais, there's no lottery for the offerings of Sukkot. Etz ala mishmarot, shekola mishmarot shonot, and as it explains in Masechet Sukkah, they would set up a cycle, they would set up a routine whereby everybody got an opportunity to participate because there were so many korbanot on, on Sukkot. But when we get... Yeah. But when we come to Shemini Atzeret, we're back to the regularly scheduled program. So that's Pais, Pei. What's the Zayin? Zayin is Zeman La'atzmo. That it has Sheikh Right? On, Suk- on Shemini Atzeret, you say it's Sheikh It's a new holiday. What's the Resh in Pazer? Regel La'atzmo. Rashi explains, She'en Shem Chag Sukkot Alav. We no longer call the holiday Chag Sukkot. We call it Shemini Chag Atzeret. Nachon? Right? So therefore what? Therefore, that's three things already that distinguish it. Now, Tosafot mentions that Rashi explains in Masechet Sukkah that what makes it regel b'fnei atzmo is not the, that we call it a different name, but that we don't sit in the Sukkah. At least in Israel, we don't sit in the Sukkah. Kashev, what's the kuf? Korban la'atzmo. Because if you look at the progression of Sukkot, what happens? You start with a very large number of korbanot, and every day the parim. 
every day the number of, uh, of bulls dwindles down, right? From 13 to 7. Right? It keeps going down. However, Shmini Atzeret is a totally different organization of Korbanot. It doesn't follow the... It's not Keseder. It doesn't follow the order of... Sukkot. It's a totally different set of korbanot. So it's, I, it's independent in that sense. What's the shin of kashev? Shir la'atmod has its own shir. Because we know that on Sukkot we say the, uh, we say the long mizmor that talks about the, uh, the uh, tzino recha, all, all of the things about the, um, the, the, that are references to the uh, nisu chamaim and nisu chayayin, etc. And on Shmini Atzeret we say, Lamanatech ala sheminit. We say a totally different shir, we say a totally different song in the Bet Knesset and also in the Bet Mikdash for Shmini Atzeret than what we said the rest of the year. And what's the Bet in Kashif? Berachala atzmo. Here, what does Rashi say? Berachala atzmo means Berachashayu mivarachin litfilat chayamelech. That they would say a blessing for the life of the king on Shmini Atzeret that we learn. Um, from uh, we learn from the story of Shlomo Melech that when he sent everybody home on Sh- by Yom Hashemini, they all blessed the king. So they would say a blessing for the king. Now Tosafot brings over on the side that Berachalef Bifneatzmo means in Birkat Hamazon and Tefillah that it has different language, uh, you know, that distinguishes it from Sukkot and so on. But in, a, in any case, there are several features that Shmini Atzeret has that distinguish it from Sukkot. Yet when it comes to Korbanot, it's a makeup day for the Korbanot that you were supposed to bring on Sukkot. It's not a totally different day. So therefore, how could you have the, how could it be logical that you would require the Kohen to separate for seven days in order to serve on Shmini Atzeret, but you wouldn't require that of Sukkot itself? That doesn't make any sense, as the Gemara says, Ravashi. So therefore, we reject that interpretation. No, but uh, I thought we were talking the for seven days for the Kohen, yeah. before Yom Kippur. Before Yom Kippur, or before he made the Para Aduma. Okay. It doesn't have to be the Kohen. Why would not do that before? Why not on other holidays? Uh, right. So, so they, tr- they said, well, Sukkot wouldn't work, Pesach not, uh, maybe Shemini Atzeret. It's a one-day holiday. It's just like the Milu'im. It's, it so it says no. It's not, because then you would need it for Sukkot too. Why are you not going to have it for Sukkot, but you're going to have it for Shemini Atzeret? That doesn't make any sense. The, that too. Ve'ema Atzeret deprishat shiva liyom echadu. What about Atzeret? What about Shavuot? That's a one-day holiday in Israel. Why don't we? Why don't we have the Kohen uh, separate for seven days before Shmini, uh, before Shavuot? Amar um, Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Abba said, "Danin parechad vayelechad mi parechad vayelechad." There's a difference because when it comes to the Miluim, it's parechad ayelechad. It's one bull and one ram, and we want to we want to take from that and apply it. To uh, and similarly, when it comes to Yom Kippur, it is Avodat Musaf Yom Kippurim. The service of Yom Kippur was also Par Echad Ayel Echad, the Musaf of Yom Kippur. One bull, one ram. But now you're bringing Shmini Atzeret. Shmini Atzeret is not one bull and one ram. Shmini Atzeret is Shne Elim, two rams. And since it's two rams, it's not comparable. It's not the same service. Hani Chalemanda Amar Yom Kippurim Ayel Echad Hu. That makes sense according to the one that says that Yom Kippurim actually had only one ram. El Lamanda Amar Shne Elim Nin Hu Ma'ika Lememar. But what about the opinion that says that there were actually two Elim on Shmini Atzeret on 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 Yom Kippur? Where who says that there are two Elim? Because in the Avodah, in Avodah Yom Kippurim in Parashat Acharimot, it mentions an Ayel Echad. Right? It mentions the Ayel. But in Chumash uh, Pikudim, okay, in Sefer Bamidbar, when it describes the Musafin, it also mentions an Ayel. So there's a Machloket. Are these the same Ayel? Or are these two different Elim? Rabbi Omer Rabbi says, According to Rabbi, the ayel that's mentioned in Parashat Acharimot is the same ayel that's mentioned in the Musafin in Parashat Pinchas. Same thing. So therefore, it's not two elim, it's one ayel. However, Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon Omer, it should say Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon Omer, Shene elim him, Hade Amur Khan, Hade Amur Bechomesh Pikudim. That according to Rabbi Elazar, no. Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon says no. That there are actually two Elim. One of the Elim is part of the Avodat Yom Kippurim, the special Avodah. And one of them is part of the Musafin. There are three things. There's Korban Tamid, there's Musaf, and there's what's called Chovat Hayom. Chovat Hayom is the special Avodah that we read about 
in Parashat Acharemot, and that we read about in the Musaf, we incorporate it into the Chazarat Hashat of the Musaf of Yom Kippur. When we repeat the Amidah of Yom Kippur, the Chazan says all of the Avodah. It doesn't mention the details of the Musaf. The Musaf was part of the service, but it's not the Chovat Hayom. Chovat Hayom is what's special about that day. Musafin, every holiday has Musafin, just different numbers of Korbanot. Chovat Hayom is on Yom Kippur. What? There can also be Chovat Hayom on other holidays. Like, for example, on, Shmini, on, uh, on Shavuot, there's the Shteh Alechem, and it comes with, you know, the Korbanot that come with the Shteh Alechem, let's say. So that's called Chovat Hayom, it's not the Musaf. The Musaf... There is nothing special in the Musaf. What's described in, in, in Parashat Emor, let's say, the service, the special service of, uh, of Shavuot... Okay, that's the special service that's described in Shav- on Shavuot in Parashat Emor is not the Musafin, that's the Shtei Alechem. Right? And there are two Elim there, and the Shtei Alechem are, uh, I'm sorry, there are two Kivasim there rather, two sheep, and the Shtei Alechem. That's not part of the Musaf. That's a separate service that's called Chovat Hayom. The Shtei Alechem and the two Kivasim, the two sheep. And then there's also Musafin. Okay, so the uh, so you have more than one um, sort of a system operating here. You have your daily korban, you have your musaf, and then you have special avodot that there are on certain holidays. For example, Rosh Hashanah doesn't have chovat hayom, but Yom Kippur has a special avodah that's unique to Yom Kippur. It's not just a musaf; it's not just more korbanot. Like musaf is just more. It doesn't work like that. It's a whole separate procedure. Shtei Alechem on Shavuot, it's a whole separate thing. It's not just a uh, more korbanot. It's a different thing. So he says, so, so the question here is, I, the ayil that's mentioned in Parshat Pinchas, is that part of the Musafin? Or the ayil rather that's mentioned in Acharemot, is that the Musaf? Is that the ayil when it says that he does the ayil? Okay? Is that referring to the one in the Musafin? Or is that a separate thing? That there's also an ayil as part of Chovat Hayom. Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon says there are two elim. One is the Musaf, one is part of the special Avodah of Yom Kippur. Rabbi says no, they're the same. But according to Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon, that means that there are two elim. Two rams. And you just told me that the only way that we can make an analogy between something, between the Milo'im, the dedication of the Mishkan and a holiday is if they have the same korbanot. And you said that the, that the issue was it has to be parachad ayelachad. One bull and one ram. But according to Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon, there are two rams on Yom Kippur, not just one. Okay, so what are we going to do here? So, afilu tem Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon hatam chad de chovat hayom chad de musafin. So what he says is, even according to Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon, we can still salvage the analogy. Why? Because we'll say like this, that over there on Yom Kippur, one of them is Chovat Hayom, and one of them is for Musafin. In other words, in the special Avodah Yom Kippur, not the Musaf, uh, every holiday has a Musaf, in the special Avodah Yom Kippur, there's only one ayah, there's only one ram. But uh, so therefore, it's still similar to the Miluim. Because in the Miluim, there was only one ram. And on Yom Kippur, the special Avodav Yom Kippur, there was only one ram. However, on Atzeret, on Shavuot, both of the rams were Chovat Hayom. Okay? Both of the rams were considered part of the service of the Shteha Lechem. Okay? Ve'elim Shinaim. That's what it says on the side there. Um, because it says mil levad or latayom, so so by the text saying mil levad or latayom, we know that it's uh, right. That it's uh, an additional one. Right, okay. the elim shenayim that comes with the with the special service of the shtei alechem of Shavuot. There are two elim. Right. The special service of Yom Kippur. There's only one ayil. Right. Now, whether or not there's also an ayil for the musaf, that's a separate question. The yeah. musaf is a different thing. Right. That's the that's that's what the answer is. So Emma Rosh Hashanah. Why don't we require the Kohen to also separate for seven days before Rosh Hashanah? Then Rosh Hashanah is parachad ayilachad. Okay. So Amar Rabbi Abahu, Rabbi Abah. So so therefore Emma Rosh Hashanah the Pishat Shiva the Yom Echadu, because that would be separating seven days for a one day service, and that's what we're looking for here, right? So we reject the Shavuot because it doesn't have the right lineup of korbanot. But on Rosh Hashanah you have parachad ayilachad. So why can't you do it there? Um, Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Abba says, "Danin parva ayil shelo, mi parva ayil shelo." La pukeat zeret viro sheshana the tzibur ninhu. You know what? The problem is that there's another similarity between the miluim and Yom Kippur, which is that on Yom Kippur it says that the kohen has to bring a parva ayil mishelo. He brings his own bull and his own ram as part of the service. 
separate from what he brings for, <clears throat> for the community. So he has his own par, partial coin gadol. Okay? So, what, so it says similar to the miluim. Because it says in the miluim, kach lecha egel ben bakar. So in other words, on Yom Kippur and the, and the Miloim, the Kohanim had to provide their own personal korbanot as part of the service. That's what makes it special, because it's personal. They're bringing their own personal offering, the Kohen. And, and the Miloim, the Kohanim brought from their own pocket. It wasn't just a communal offering. But, but uh, Rosh Hashanah or Shavuot, how can you compare? That's totally communal. That's not personal for the Kohen. Says the Gemara. The Gemara says that makes sense according to the one that says whenever it says kach take for yourself or do for yourself mishelcha, it means it has to come from you. So therefore, the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur is bringing his own korban, right? The Kohen at the Miloim, the Kohanim are bringing their own korbanot. But according to the one that says that actually it comes from the Tzibur even here. Even on Yom Kippur it comes from the Tzibur. Even on the Miluim it comes from the Tzibur. Because we don't interpret Lecha as meaning it has to come from you. So then what are we going to do? It's the same then. Because the Breitah says according to Divir Rabbi Yoshia according to Rabbi Yoshia whenever it says for you, kach lecha, take for yourself. Va'ase lecha, make for yourself. It means mishelcha. It has to come from your own pocket. V'yikhu elecha, shem en zaitzach. When it says they should bring for you oil, okay? Or they should bring for you para aduma, or whatever it is. That means what? That it comes from the community and the Kohen is just doing his job. Right. Kach lecha. Right, so that's, that, that's talking to the community though. It's not talking to the Kohen. So it's, it's easier to see. But according to Rabbi Yoshia, when it says lecha and it's addressing the Kohen, it means it has to come from his personal pocket. So according to, but Rabbi Yonatan, Omer, ben kach lecha, ben vikhoi lecha, mishal tzibur. No, in all cases, all korbanot that are part of the official service are from the community. They're not from the Kohen personally. So why does it say kach lecha? Kevayachol, mishelcha, nirotei yoter mishelahem. Why then does it say kach lecha? When it speaks to the Kohen, why does it say take for yourself or take from your own? Not because, not because it actually has to come out of his pocket, but because it means I like your korban even better than the community. In other words, it's an honor to the Kohen. He doesn't want to, the Torah doesn't want to say, you, I like you even better than the community. If, you were, if it were coming from you, it would mean even more, Hashem, Hashem says. It doesn't want to write that, so it says it as if, as if it's coming from you. Okay, but really it doesn't come from you personally. Really it comes from the community. Abba Hanan Amar, Abba Hanan says, Mishum Rabbi Elazar, in the name of Rabbi Elazar, Katube Harome Rasita Lecha Aron Etz. One Pasuk says, Make for yourself Aron Etz. Make for yourself a wooden box that's going to contain the Luchot. The Katube Harome Rasu Aron Atze Shitim, and another Pasuk says, That the people should make Atze Shitim. They should make the Aron out of Atze Shitim. The people should make it. So, how can that be become? Bizman she sell osin rutono shel makom. Can bizman she osin rutono shel makom. Same concept here. In other words, when it says lecha, make for yourself an aron, it's not saying you have to make it out of your own pocket, Moshe Rabbeinu. You have to take the money out of your own pocket. It means that I want it to only be for you because I don't like these people so much. In other words, she en osin rutono shel makom. The people are not doing the right thing. But when they're doing the right thing, the asu aron, they should all do it. Okay, meaning it's really coming from the community. I'm just attributing it to you, Moshe Rabbeinu, because the people are not so good right now. That's what it means. But what does that mean? Whether it says lecha or not lecha, it always means that it comes from the community, according to Rabbi Yonatan. And if that's the case, we have a problem. Why? Because according to him, what's the difference between Rosh Hashanah Korbanot and Yom Kippur? What's the difference between Rosh Hashanah and Miluim? If it's always coming from the community, it's not coming from the personal pocket of, Yom Ki, of the Kohen. So why is there a difference between the Korbanot? Why shouldn't we require the uh, Kohen to separate for seven days before Rosh Hashanah too? Answer is, Ad kan lo palige ella bikihot te alma, ta asiyot te alma. Kihot alma kach lecha samim, asiyot te alma ase lecha shete chatotrot kese. They're only arguing Rabbi Yonatan and Rabbi Yoshia when you're speaking in general. Like when it says kach lecha samim, like you said about the kor, about the ketoret, or when it says ase lecha shete chatotrot kesef, when Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, make the two silver trumpets. 
That's where they have a machloket. Did it have to come out of Moshe Rabbeinu's personal uh, pocket or not? Did the ketoret have to come out of uh, Aharon? He had to pay for the ketoret. That's where they have a machloket. Asiyot be'alma. Aval anach, porushek ha'mifaresh de mishel chahu. But in our case, in the miluim, the dedication of the kohanim, and of the Mishkan, it explicitly says it has to come from them. And so too with Yom Kippur. Because first it says, speak to Bnei Israel, and they should bring Seir Ezim Nechatat. They should bring a goat for a chatat. And then it says, say to Aharon, take for yourself a bull, a calf. For the chatat. What does that mean? Lamali. Right? Why does it say it again? Shema min. In other words, why does it emphasize kach lecha? Take for yourself. Shema mina kach lecha mishel chahu. That means you have to take for your, yourself. In other words, you already brought a sin offering for the people. Now take for yourself. Okay? That's extra. And biyom akibur imechti ketiv bezot yavo aron el hakodesh b'far b'em lakar lachatat. Because it says when Ahar, with regard to Yom Kippur that with this the Aharon can go into the Kodesh HaKodeshim with a parben bakar lachatat umeet adat b'nei Yisrael yikach shenei seirizim lachatat v'yekriv et par lachatat ashelo lamali right so it mentions the korbanot and it mentions that from the Jewish people should be brought the two seirim the two goats and then it says that he brings the par lachatat ashelo the bull of sin offering that is his. What does it mean? Why does it have to say that? Shema mina hai lo mishelohu. The emphasis means that this lo is literally his because of the emphasis. It distinguishes between him and the re- the other korbanot, his korban, which is personally his, and the rest of the korbanot. So you see from that emphasis that really it belongs to him. So that's why the miluim and yom kippur have something in common, namely. That the korbanot being brought in both cases are coming from the personal fund of the Kohen. And that's why he has to separate for seven days. Rav Ashi, Amar Rav Ashi says, I have a simpler reason why we don't do it um, on Rosh Hashanah. Why, why not? Because Danin par lechatat vayle ola. Because on, in the Miluim case, the, the dedication of the, of the Mishkan and the installation of the Kohanim, they brought a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Mipar lechatat ba'ileola, and the same was on Yom Kippur, right? In other words, Yom Kippur and Miluim were the same. The bull, the bull was a sin offering, the ram was a burnt offering. Rosh Hashanah olot ninhu. But on Rosh Hashanah and Atzeret, on Rosh Hashanah and Shavuot, both the ram and the bull were burnt offerings. They were not chatat. They were not sin offerings. So there's no comparison. It's not the same korbanot. Forget about whether it came from this guy's money or that guy's money. It's not the same korbanot, actually. It's the same animals, but not the same type of korban. Ravina Amar Danin Avodah B'Kohen Gadol Me'avodah B'Kohen Gadol Apokhe Kulu Kushyatan Kushyatin Delav Avodah B'Kohen Gadol Neno So he says, Ravina says, I have an even more basic difference. Why can we learn Miloim? Why do we only learn to Yom Kippur? From the Miloim, why? Because that's the only case where the Kohen Gadol personally must do the service. Right? The installation of the Kohanim, the Aharon had to do it. And Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol, has to do it. He has no choice. On Rosh Hashanah, the Kohen Gadol doesn't have to do it. On Shavuot, the Kohen Gadol doesn't have to do it. No other time does the Kohen Gadol have to do it. Only Miloim and Yom Kippur. So therefore, that's when we separate the Kohen Gadol. And that would, re- that would resolve all of our questions about why not Pesach, why not Sukkot, why not Shavuot, why not Rosh Hashanah. About the they would all be resolved by that. Or why not Shemini Atzeret? That's, that's a separate thing. Right? But in terms of these other cases, why do we exclude them? Oh, simply because it doesn't have to be Kohen Gadol. We, we, we learn out first service from first service. To exclude these which are not first service. What does first service mean? What does it mean? What does it mean first? If you mean that the Kohen Gadol has to officiate at, on Yom Kippur, just like he had to officiate in the, uh, at the Miloim. At the installation service. Hi, no kamaita. Then he's saying the same thing twice. You told me that there were two different versions of what Ravina said. Now you're telling me it's the same thing. That Ravina before said that the difference between Yom Kippur and all other cases is that just like the Miluim, only the Kohen Gadol can serve. And now you're saying the same thing in different words. T- t- that it's Avoda, that it's Tchila, right? That it's Avoda Tchila. It's first service. And you're saying that means the same thing. It's the Kohen Gadol. No, can't be. 
Right? Ela avodat chilab b'makom. Me avodat chilab b'makom. What it means is it's the first service in the place. What does that mean, the first service in the place? So Rashi says, Yom kippurim yesh avodat lifnai v'lifnim. Right? Yom kippur, he goes into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. Shab yom kippurim harishon hayta tchilab b'makom. Because that was the first time anybody ever went into the Kodesh HaKodeshim was on Yom Kippur. The first Yom Kippur ever was the first time anybody ever went into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. Shkod l'chen lo nechnas adam sham l'avoda. That was the first time somebody ever went in. And, and the day of the installation of the Kohanim was the first time that anybody ever served in the outer altar because the, up till then it was Moshe Rabbeinu doing the service he didn't count but it was the first time the Kohanim were using the outer altar in the proper way so since Yom Kippur was the first time they ever entered the Kodesh HaKodeshim and it's similar then to the installation service of the Kohanim which was the first time the Kohanim did any Avodah Get it? Got it? Okay. So therefore, that's why Yom Kippur is similar to the Milu'im. Because it was the first occasion where the Kodesh HaKodeshim was used. And of course, we, had, we do it every year, but it reenacts that first time. When Rav Dimi came, he said that Rav Yochanan matne chada. Rav Yosho ben Levi matne tarte. That Rav Yochanan taught one. Rabbi Yosho ben Levi taught two. What does that mean? Rabbi Yochanan matne chadal lasod lechaper ilumase yom kipurim. That Rabbi Yochanan only learned that. Remember, we learned that at the end of the miluim, at the end of the description of the service of the installation of the dedication of the mishkan and the installation of the kohanim, it said, "This is what Hashem commands you to do all the time lechaper alechem." To, to atone for yourselves. And we said, oh, that's referring to two things. It's referring to Yom Kippur and also the Para Aduma. That in both cases, the Kohen has to be in, a, in, in, in a, an isolation chamber for seven days, right? Rabbi Yochanan doesn't say that. He says, only Yom Kippur. For Rabbi Yosho ben Levi, matne tarte lasot elumase para, lechaper elumase Yom Kippurim. Rabbi Yosho ben Levi learns both of them. Okay, he's learning that, no, both. So Rabbi Yochanan matne chadav ha'anan t'nan shivat yamim kodem yom kipurim shivat yamim kodem serifat apara. So what about the fact that we learned in the Mishnah seven days before yom kipurim and seven days before the burning of the para aduma? What does Rabbi Yochanan do with that? It's an explicit Mishnah. Was Rabbi Yochanan forgot the Mishnah? Doesn't he know that the Mishnah says that what? That also for the para aduma he has to separate for seven days. How can he only apply that rule to yom kipur? Answer. Ma'ala ba'alma, all that is, is a ma'ala ba'alma, meaning the rabbis made that to emphasize, to, to emphasize and, and inspire people to treat the, the purity of the para aduma with, uh, with greater attention. But it's not really me'ikar adin, it's not mina Torah. But didn't Rabbi Manyumi Bar Chilkia say that Rabbi Mechasia Bar Idi said that Rabbi Yochanan said that that pasuk when Moshe Rabbeinu says after the installation of the Kohanim that this is what Hashem commanded you to do to atone for yourselves in the future didn't, didn't he say there that this is the Maase Para and Yom Kippur. In other words, wasn't it reported in the name of Rabbi Yochanan that both for the Para Aduma and for Yom Kippur there is a biblical requirement for the Kohen to separate for seven days? Not only rabbinic. Didn't Rabbi Yochanan himself say that? According to uh, what we learned from Rav Man Yumi, he did. So the answer is Hahu Dirabe. That was his teacher's teaching, not his own. In other words, Rabbi Yochanan himself said that for the Para Aduma it's only rabbinic. It's not biblical. But for the, for the, for, but his teacher held that both cases were biblical. How do we know that that's true? The Kiyata Ravin. Because when Ravin came from Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Yochanan, he said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Mishum Rabbi Yishmael. In the name of Rabbi Yishmael, La'asot ilomase para lechaper ilomase yom kippurim. In other words, Rabbi Yochanan was reporting his own teacher's teaching. Rabbi Yishmael. But he himself thought that the separation prior to the para aduma was only rabbinic. Only ma'ala ba'alma. Amar le Resh Lakish, le Rabbi Yochanan. Resh Lakish said to his chavruta Rabbi Yochanan, Mechakal yalfatla, mi miluim. You are learning out this idea of seven days of separation from the miluim, from the installation of the Kohen, of the Kohanim, and the dedication of the Mishkan. But ima miluim kol ha-katub ben me'akev ben, af ha-chana min kol ha-katub ben me'akev ben. Well, just like by the miluim, by the initial dedication, Anything that's left out from the service is me'akev. Anything left out of the service would invalidate it. 
So, so to here, are you saying that not separating the Kohen for seven days before Yom Kippur invalidates the service? That's not. If you're going to tell me that that in fact is the case, and if the Kohen doesn't separate for seven days before Yom Kippur, his service is invalid. Wait a second. But it says that we, we supply an understudy for the Kohen Gadol, a backup. Now, if it's true that the Kohen Gadol is invalid for service, if he doesn't separate for seven days, how can we put aside an, a backup Kohen? It doesn't say Mafrishin. It doesn't say that that second Kohen has to separate for seven days before. He doesn't have to. We just appoint him. So what does that mean? That even though he didn't separate for seven days before, if we have to call him in to serve, he can serve without separating. So obviously it's not Ma'akev. So the Gemara says, my matkinin mafrishin. And if you're going to tell me that by matkinin it means mafrishin, in other words, that we have to require both the Kohen Gadol himself and also his understudy, both of them have to separate for seven days, then wait a second, oh, idi matkinin, oh, idi mafrishin. Then it's litni, oh, idi idi matkinin, oh, idi idi mafrishin. It should say either matkinin or mafrishin, but you can't say, the same. why would you use two different words for the same thing? In other words, if you want to say that the understudy also had to separate, it should say, Mafrishin lo kohen acher. Tachtav. That we separate another kohen. It should use the same words. Mafrishin. It shouldn't say, Mafrishin for the kohen gadol and Matkinin for the, for the uh, second kohen. It should say, Mafrishin for both. Mm-hmm. So obviously it means he doesn't have to separate. Amar lei, Rabbi Yochanan Tzatim, Elamar Mehecha Yalifla. So then you, Reish Lakish, where do you get the idea of seven days of separation if you think that it's wrong to get it from the Miluim? Because if I get it from the Miluim, that means it's Me'akev, that without it, the Kohen service will be invalid. And now you're saying that the Kohen service will not be invalid. So where do you learn it from then? Amar Lehi said to him, Amar Misinai, I learned it from Har Sinai. Because it says there, That it says that Moshe Rabbeinu had to wait six days. The, uh, the, the mountain was covered by a cloud. This is after the giving of the Aseret HaDibrot, after the Ten Commandments, when Moshe is about to go up on the mountain for the 40 days. So he's sitting there. He has to wait six days. And on the seventh day, Hashem calls him in. So since it tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu was called into the mountain on the seventh day, why does it have to mention that he waited for six days? We know that he waited for six days if he's called on the seventh day. So what does it tell you? It teaches you that anybody who's going to go into the, so to speak, the Mahane Shekhinah is going to go into the camp of the Divine Presence has to separate for six days. Since Moshe Rabbeinu is going to the highest level of spiritual elevation, he has to separate for six days. So to the Kohen is going to go into the Kodesh HaKodeshim and Yom Kippur. He has to separate for six days. Okay? What's the obvious question? What six days? What are you talking about? It's seven days. Right, right. Well, what's the six days? All right. So the most obvious question ever. Very nice. You proved six days, but we're talking about seven days. So what does that mean? So, ah, very simple. Because our Mishnah is going like Rabbi Yudab and Beto, Who is worried about the Tumah of his house. What does Tumat Beto mean? So Rashi says, The problem is, the last night before he goes home, Right. The, in other words, the last night that uh, before he uh, before he gets separated, if he has relations with his wife, he's going to have us, and she finds out that she was in nida. Okay, then what's going to happen? He's going to have seven days of tumah on him, and it's going to be seven complete days of tumah, which means that he won't even be ready. In other words, if he only waited six days and the seventh day came, he wouldn't be ready. So since, so we have to make it seven days. So that way there's seven full days just in case the last night that he was home he had relations with his wife and right after she found out that she was a nida and oive, what happens to a person who's boel nida? Vatehi nidata alav. He gets the same tumah as the woman. So now he has seven full days of tumah. What's going to happen if you only made him separate six days? The seventh day is Yom Kippur and he's not tahor. So we have to give him seven days. Yes. 
Right, that's, that's another one. Yeah. If a woman finds out that they had a relationship, but they didn't know, it goes back 24 hours. That's a whole, no, no, that's about taharot. That's, a, that's not about the, that's a whole other thing. That's about the foods that, that, that may she makes tamay. The point here is, but, right, they didn't, they didn't accept it. Right. They said he's, he's Ashkenazi, he can't have a second wife. So what happened? Yeah. No. So, so the, the thing is, if there was only six days of separation before Yom Kippur, right? So what might happen is the last night he was home, what if he had relations with his wife the last night before he went into the isolation? And she finds out immediately that she's Nida. So he's Bo'el Nida. Now he has seven days of Tuma. What's going to happen? The last day is Yom Kippur. It's the seventh day. He's not Tahor. So therefore they made seven days. So that just in case, Chayish letumat betod. In other words, he made him add a day. Really, you only need what? According to Rish Lakish? Day. Six days. Because, because Moshe Rabbeinu waited six days. On the seventh day, he could go in. So six days before Yom Kippur should be okay. Because the seventh day is going into Kodesh Kodeshim. But since Rabbi Yehuda ben Bitera says you should add on another day, just in case he's going to end up being Bo'el Nida. Okay, that's why it's seven days. Amarle Rabbi Yochanan Rish Lakish, Rabbi Yochanan said to Rish Lakish, "Bishlam al didi delfina mimiluim hainu detanya zev zem azin lav kol shiva mikol hatot shayusham tavay nami hazab miluim." So he said, according to me that we learn from the Miluim, it makes sense that it says that every day of the seven days that he was in isolation, they put the para aduma ashes on him. Just like every day that the Kohanim were in isolation in the Mishkan, in the dedication in the Mishkan, they, they would splash on them dumb from the Korbanot. So he's getting splashed every day with something. But according to you, But according to you that you're learning it from Sinai, where did they get this practice of splashing the para aduma on him every day? Amar Rish Lakish said to him, miluim dam hachamayim. What do you mean? It's not an analogous anyway. Over by the, in the Miluim, it was blood of the Korbanot. Here, it's water from Para Aduma. So he answered him, Ha, Lokashu, we can, that's not such a problem because, Detane Rabbi Hayan Nichnesu Maim Tahadam. Because we'll just say, in the time of the Miluim, it was, it was blood. Now we're using water, but it's the same concept. Elalididach, Hazab Sinai Mihaivai. So he answered him, Amar lei, ma'la be'alma. So in other words, he will say, ma'la be'alma. All it is, is a rabbinic stringency. In other words, they wanted to emphasize the purity of the Kohen Gadol so much that they made him have the para aduma ashes applied to him all the time. It's not learned from Miloim, Reish Lakish says. No, we're not learning it from the installation of the Kohanim in the times of the Mishkan. We're learning it from Sinai. We're learning it from Har Sinai that he's going into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. Just like Moshe Rabbeinu went up on the mountain. That's the analogy. Why did they sp- splash on him para aduma ashes every day? Ma'la be'alma. Not because they learned it from Har Sinai. No, there was no splashing at Har Sinai. Only because we want to emphasize the absolute, that we took every precaution, that we did everything we could to, to ensure the purity of the Kohen Gadol as he approaches Yom Kippur.